it felt like everything I had been doing up to this point led me to member for a day. It combined the three things that I enjoyed really the most. My career was running business development for tech companies for 10 years in New York City. I obviously love golf and I love doing charitable work. I mean, perfect example, a little over a year ago, I spent six weeks down in the US Virgin Islands doing hurricane recovery cleanup work after hurricanes Irma and Maria. And it was probably the best month plus of my life. Member for a day just combined all those things. So to date, including the, my original COVID auction, I've done six auctions. I've raised over $215,000. But all of a sudden in the next couple months, we're gonna start doing some really big things. We're gonna get some really high profile athletes, celebrities involved, big charities, big name courses all around the country. So without going into too much, next month is going to take member for a day to just a completely different stratosphere. Golf Smarter, number 765. Stay tuned to hear your name called as the winner of a brand new ShotScope V3 GPS and Performance Tracker watch. Play the greatest courses in the world while giving to charity with Member for a Day. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Eric. Fred, good to be here. It's nice to meet you as we have mutual friends that we play golf with. Uh, but you, we are on opposite coast, so hopefully someday we'll get a chance to play together too. Absolutely, coming in live from Hilton Head, South Carolina, right now. Yeah, uh, live reporting live from this is CNN. No, election day is when uh, this show is being published. Election day, twenty twenty. Um, so let's talk about public service. No, I'm kidding. Let's <laughs> let's talk about what you're doing for the community. You've come up with a really interesting idea. Um, this is not golf instruction, but this is a way to help organizations, um, help golfers, and hopefully there's something in it for all of us. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, and first of all, obviously, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I... You know, I think it's it's really worthwhile to sort of tell tell the story of how this all came to be, because if I just jumped into what we're doing, it there wouldn't really be context and you wouldn't really understand. And so, um, you know, going into COVID, I was uh, or I should say I, I was let go at the beginning of COVID. I was unemployed, um, realized that I probably wasn't going to get another job anytime soon. And was sort of looking for a way to be creative and a way to give back. Um, combine that with my desire and passion to just play as much and be around golf as much as possible. And so it led me down this path of um, ultimately deciding to do a charity golf auction. And you know, I've been fortunate to have played some of the greatest private golf courses in the world. And so I just started reaching out to um, my network, both PGA professionals as well as members of some of the greatest golf courses in the world, and just asking them if they would be interested in donating a round of golf um, to support COVID relief, specifically to feed hospital frontline workers in New York City. And good for you. after about two weeks, I got 20 of the, the quote-unquote best golf courses in the world to commit to giving rounds uh, to be auctioned off. Uh, May 14th, I believe was the day, threw it out on social. Uh, I didn't spend a penny on marketing. This was all just organic. And, um, you know, I, I had a modest goal. I think ten dollars to $15,000 would be great. You know, this was just a side project. And next thing you know, it the thing just took off. And I remember a few specific numbers. Uh, I remember within the first 24 hours, we had raised over $12,000. So that was basically my goal for the whole week. And we did it in 24 hours. So I was like, okay. Mm. Um, but the second larger thing was that I just started receiving hundreds of messages from people all around the world on Instagram. Some just saying, thank you. You know, you've inspired me, my wife, my son, my brother, my husband is a frontline worker. Thank you for supporting them, which are just warmed my heart dearly. Sure. Um, and then as well, there were people all around the world who were members of some of the greatest golf courses on earth and said, love what you're doing. Can we support with a donation? 
And so I started getting more and more and more rounds from people that I've never met before. So by the time we finished the auction, I had 48 rounds of golf. Keep in mind, I started with 20. So almost 60% of the rounds were donated from people that just either followed me on social media or found me on social media or their friends sent it to them or something. And so what started off as this little side project, I ended up raising over $101,000 in seven days. Oh my God. <laughs> Which was pretty much my exact response too. I mean, the last night. The last, <laughs> I'm sure those are three words were exactly. Yeah, the there might've been a couple of curse words in there too. <laughs> but the last night going into it, we had raised 65,000, which was by, you know, still blew me away. And then in the last three hours, we raised over $36,000. It just went crazy. I mean, uh, a threesome at Shinnecock sold for $11,000. So that feeds wow. over 1,100 hospital frontline workers for one round of golf, wow. um, just for context. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, this all, you know, I, I didn't do this to start a business. I didn't do this to do anything. I literally took the money and gave it to uh, Project Frontline, and they go into um, – big cities, buy meals from local restaurants, supporting the local economy, then deliver them to hospital frontline workers to feed them. And, um, you know, a funny thing happened. I, I, my story got kind of picked up. I, I was written up in a bunch of different um, golf magazines. I was in the New York Post. And next thing you know, I had a whole slew of nonprofits reach out to me and said, you did this for COVID. Can you do it for heart disease? Can you do it for cancer, leukemia, and on and on and on? And I just said, yeah, sure. I, I think so. And um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm, my background is in technology. I'm not a non, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of nonprofit work, but my business, my career has never been in the nonprofit space. And so I didn't know anything about nonprofit fundraising or anything. And so just called, you know, classic, just called everyone in my network who are smarter than me, picked their brains got a lot of amazing ideas and essentially created a scalable model where then I could spin up a nonprofit fundraising platform through golf to allow any and all nonprofits to uh, meet and hopefully exceed their fundraising goals. But you're not a 501c3. You're not a nonprofit. I'm not. So I've been, And does the money go through you? It does. Yeah. So basically I handle everything, right? So I handle I build a custom auction site. I run all the social media, paid ads, all the payments, communication, emails, everything. Um, and then the, I, I send a check off to the nonprofit. Um, and so I guess I think that the traditional definition of what I am is a, or like by the IRS, I'm a professional fundraiser. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, nonprofits bring me in and through, through the game of golf, we're able to raise a substantial amount of money. So let's get into the uh, the like this person wrote an eleven thousand dollar check to play at Shinnecock, but they don't get the deduction. No, they do. They absolutely. Do. Oh, yeah. because it's going through you. You're not the so. I'm just handling is... the payments, but it's going directly to them. Absolutely, they can. Okay. Yeah, okay. They, it's absolutely. Yeah, I'm kind of like the, I'm the conduit. I guess is the better way of explaining it. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, we okay. get that tax donation for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And the person that donates um, the round gets an in-kind donation as well, so it's a two-sided donation, obviously. But not not if it's donated by the club. Uh, I th I think they still because, can, but I, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, because that's just part of their inventory that I, I can't imagine, and I could be wrong. And if somebody's listening who knows better, please let me know. But yeah. it, it, I can't imagine that golf courses who give a round away can say, well, that was worth 50 bucks. Yeah, I mean, they might be able to. I doubt they really oh, I guess they donate stuff. Yeah, yeah they donate. Uh, it seems like the most of the courses that I deal with sort of, they have a set number of rounds they donate per year, whether it's 20, 50, 100. They just say, this is the amount we're donating. And if they get a bunch of nonprofit requests early on, that, that suffice sort of what they're looking for. Uh, they hit sense. their quota and that's it. Yeah. Okay. So then they can just, it's on the books at the beginning of the year going, this is our, in, our donation. Okay. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense. So uh, um, are, are these donations that are made um, by either a member or by the golf course themselves? Are we only talking about private courses that you're looking at or, 
Are you just any golf course in any area? Yeah. Are they all the you know northeast section of the United States? Does it just cover that area? Yeah. So the first thing is we're, we're global, and so the way it works okay. is it's, it's really based upon the nonprofit we work with. So, for mm-hmm. example, next year I'm doing uh, an online auction with a, a Wisconsin-based nonprofit. So because of that, okay. most of their contacts are in the Midwest, so we'll have a lot more Midwest golf courses. So it's really dependent upon. Um, their network, their donors, and the golf courses that we can come up with. Um, but no, we are we are totally global. Um, in terms of the first question, the short answer is it's overwhelmingly overwhelmingly majority private courses. With that said, I feel like I have a very good pulse of golf courses that have value, right? And so there are other ones, of course, Pinehurst, Whistling Straits, Sand Valley, Cabot Links, Bandon Dunes. Those have value. So if we do stay and play packages at Bandon Dunes, of course, we would put that on because people want to play there and it would raise a substantial amount of money. With that said, the overwhelming majority are private courses. And that's sort of the, I think, what's inherently um, special about this model. And if you think about it just purely from an economics perspective, private golf courses are just that. They're private. So unless you know a member or, or you are a member yourself, you can't play them. And so inherently as golfers, most of us really want to play private golf courses. And so what that means is you're talking about a supply that's next to zero and a demand that's next to infinity. And it doesn't take an economics PhD to figure out that that makes for a really good model because it just amplifies the value, right? Because with those supply and demand features, we're talking about, you know, Perfect example, Shinnecock going for eleven thousand dollars. You know, I think the guest fee at Shinnecock, if you just play with the members, I don't know, a hundred or two hundred bucks, but it's selling for eleven thousand dollars when it goes for charity because you just can't get on. And so, um, the private aspect certainly ramps up the amount of money very quickly that we can raise for nonprofits. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you, man. That's really awesome. Right, we're going to take a time out. We'll be back right after this. If you're a fan of Golf Smarter, thank you. <laughs> and you also enjoy hearing past episodes, thank you. But if you want to learn more from our guests, then you shouldn't miss our other podcast, which is Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insights from the best instructors featured on Golf Smarter. This week's episode is part two uh, with custom club fitter Dan Sachs, and this time he answers questions submitted by our audience. That's you. I'm a huge advocate of trying stuff. Even the people that I fit with golf clubs, they want more. It's funny, you know, I'm a pretty big fan of The Simpsons. And uh, there was this great episode where Homer and and Monty Burns, who's the head of the nuclear power plant, are trapped in this snow cabin. And Homer says, you know, you're you're an incredibly wealthy and successful guy. And, And Monty says, yes, but I would trade it all for just a little more. (laughs) <laughs> and I think that's how a lot of golfers feel. You know, you may you may hit, uh, you know, 13 fairways in a round and you feel like you're not getting enough. You may hit 16 greens in a round and, and you feel like I just want to hit those next two, you know, and that that's what makes you want to get better. That should that's be what, what makes you want to improve lure of golf. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That even if you're, you know, you always want to be a little bit better. Sure. You know, and that's the great frustrations in golf. Too. Yeah, but it's not necessarily a club issue all the time. That's episode 81 of Golf Smarter Mulligans featuring custom club fitter and maker Dan Sachs being released this Friday. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are free and available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe. And when you do, You'll be notified immediately when a brand new episode of either has downloaded to your favorite podcast app. Eric, a few minutes ago, you mentioned that you've played some of the greatest courses in the country. How'd you get to do that? (laughs) I know I'm curious. (laughs) We'll get back to your business in a second, but how'd you, how'd you pull that one off? That's a really good question. I think. Are you in real estate business? I'm not. I was in <laughs> finance for a couple your, years. I got out very quickly. Yeah, it's funny. I feel like real estate and finance is the short answer. Um, but yeah. no, not for me. For the the sort of general answer is that I'm that person that has just like I grew up in Westchester County. I was not a country club kid, and so I would drive by the gates of Wingfoot and Quaker Ridge and Westchester CC. These iconic golf course layouts. And I would just sit in bed and dream of just, you know, 
how do I play these courses? They look amazing. And wow, like the PGA tour was there. And so I say that because it, it never became an obsession, but it was close in the sense that it's always top of mind for me. And I'll give you an example. I'm the guy that if I'm at uh, a, a friend's birthday party or whatever, and I see someone with a logo on their shirt, let's say it's Shinnecock or Wingfoot, I'm going to go up to that person and talk to them and just have a conversation. I'm not going to say, can you invite me? But immediately I'm going to talk golf. And so it's always top of mind for me. And all of a sudden, you know, over the last, you know, let's say my 20s of sort of building that up and just meeting people and being genuine and showing my just great interest in playing iconic golf courses, all of a sudden the ball started rolling and I started to get some invites that I that I wasn't previously at. Once then I got those invites, I started to take some decent photos. There, I'm getting better every day um, and sort of started to then accumulate a decent following on Instagram at member for a day. And then other people started inviting me. You know, they saw my passion. They saw the way I photograph golf courses. Um, and in turn, then they would invite me. And so it's one of these things where it's just kind of a snowball effect. And I pinch myself all the time. Uh, some of the golf courses I played, I can't express this enough. I've had actual dreams while sleeping of playing these courses. And that next thing you know, I'm walking there. Ooh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, you were saying Instagram, you're at member for a I'm day. member for a day. That's right. And what are your, what are your photographs? I mean, do you do... I've learned, and I love photography as well. I've learned you really just can't take photos while you're playing on a golf course because at noon there's no shadows. It's just bright light. It's eh. You need to be in the golden hour here. You need to be. There have to be great shadows on the course to get good photos. Yeah, golden hour is key. Um, and so because of that, I do try to get there. If I have a morning tea time, I'll get there early. If I have an afternoon tea time, I'll ask if I can stay late. Um, I do ask permission for golf courses to let me fly my drone. A lot of them say no. Some of them say yes. Um, oh, so you're you're taking photos of your drone? I'm doing drone. Uh, mostly iPhone. Oh, I actually sweet. just ordered a camera. It's coming today, and I can't wait. I got the Sony Alpha Which Two um, okay. with with a beautiful lens, and so I'm super excited for that because hopefully that'll take my photos to the next level. But yeah, I, I don't know. I the the original idea of Member for a Day was it's it's so funny because the name member for a day just worked so well with what I'm doing with charity, but it was obviously never the, that, that was not the idea. The idea of member for a day originally was I want people to feel like they are a member for a day, basically to be able to live vicariously through me. And hopefully I can take photographs, not just of like the iconic holes, but really show them small things like the wa walking bridges and paths through the woods. And, you know, maybe photographs of inside the locker room, just things that, will give them a little bit more of, of a taste and, and let them be a member for a day. And so, um, you know, it's funny cause I posted a photo last night about interlocking, which I was fortunate to play a couple of weeks ago. And it was, it was my favorite photo for that day because, um, I don't know if you've ever played there before, but basically the 10th tee box is right next to the clubhouse. And if you, if you basically go inside to get a bite to eat, and you walk out, there's this walkway with arches and I'm sort of walking along this way. And as I walk along, I look to the left and the 10th hole is just framed perfectly inside this arch. And the guys I was playing with were getting ready to tee up. And I just stood there right there and just took a couple photos. And so you have the archway of the interlock and the house mm. looking straight down this. A lot of people think it's the best, best hole in the golf course. It is like this classic volcano, Donald Ross green in the distance. You can really see it. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I, I guess I, um, I'm not, I'm not a classically trained photographer at all. I just try to take, um, photographs that, that speak to me and hopefully it, it shows across a medium such as social media and people appreciate uh, my perspective. So cool. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Now let's get back to, to what you're doing. So, um, are these, uh, the online auctions for the charities that you're doing? That they're online auctions, so anybody can participate, or you have to be a registered to. It's I guess it depends on the nonprofit's event. Yeah, so no, any, anybody can participate. Basically, when you go on the auction site, you will have to register and give your credit card, and then you start bidding right away. Uh, they're generally week long auctions. They're sort of eBay style, so basically 
you list your maximum bid and then the software will automatically bid for you if someone else comes and tries to get it up. Um, and okay. yeah, it's pretty much. So you no need to watch it real closely. That's right. Because right. basically over the years I've learned auctions, the best way to do it is be the last person. <laughs> Don't be the first. <laughs> yeah. Don't bid against yourself. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I've certainly learned a lot about auction dynamics over the past couple of months. And not surprisingly, most of the action happens in the beginning and the end. Um, so I'm, I'm yeah. still trying to figure out that perfect amount of time. I think, you know, part of my job, though, Fred, is also highlighting the nonprofit. Right. And so nonprofits see me as a way of marketing and showcasing the amazing work that they do. And so if I shorten the auction too much, it gives me less time to talk about all the amazing nonprofit work that they're doing. And so I it's interesting because my platform started as golf but it is, it is transforming to golf and charity. And I'm really balancing those two um, and to use golf as a medium to showcase amazing nonprofits. Good, again, good for you. You know that, that I think it was Troon for years used member for a day as how they treat their, you know. It's yeah. really interesting because I'm in conversation with them right now to do a partnership. So they haven't, they haven't oh. said that, so. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was them that, that like, because they have courses that are public courses. Yeah. They're fee, daily fee courses, but they always had this. I did a couple of videos for them and um, they was always like, treat, treat them like they're a member for the day. Hey, I, I, I'm funny. surprised they haven't said that. I, I mean, I started speaking to them last week, so that's funny. Um, you know, I think. Do a little research. Yeah, I definitely will. I really want to do a little I'm research. trademarking it. I'm, I'm trademarking member for a day for golf, so. Good luck for that one. It's looking pretty Sir, good. A service mark, not a trademark <laughs> for all the lawyers out there. All right, let's take another quick bite. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this and then we'll come back and we'll thank you for the work that you're doing. Be right back. I'm curious. So you have a place on your website that we can sign up for your newsletter, your updates. What is, what is that exactly? Yeah. It's memberforaday.com, all the words. Um, and yeah, you can sign up right there on the website. And then anytime I have a new charity golf auction, uh, my email subscribers are the first to know about it. Right. So then, then we would be, here I am in California. There's you got something going abandoned dunes here uh, up in Oregon. I would know about it, so I'd have the opportunity to be bidding on that. So anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, hopefully for you, uh, we can bid on anything and everything Absolutely. just by staying in touch with your website. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, and we have you know, Fred. It's it's an interesting time that we talk because so. To date, including the, my original COVID auction, I've done six auctions. I've raised over $215,000. So we're making really nice headway. Um, but all of a sudden, in the next couple months, we're going to start doing some really big things. Um, next month, especially, um, we were, we're, you know, I, I can't fully tell everything yet. We're kind of still keeping it a little bit um, under wraps, but it's just, it's just the there's, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and a few thousand oh, really um, hey. and um but we're we're gonna get some really high profile um athletes celebrities involved um big charities um big name courses all around the country um so yeah without without going into too much next month is is hopefully going to take member for a day to just a completely different um stratosphere if you will do you really, you're committed now. This is like working. It's like, okay, I can do this for a while. Yeah. It's one of those things, Fred, where it, everything, if it, it felt like everything I had been doing up until this point led me to member for a day. And what I mean by that is wow. it combined the three things that I enjoyed really the most. Um, one is, is internet platform businesses. My, my career was running business development for tech companies for 10 years in New York city. So I love big tech platform companies. I obviously love golf and I love doing charitable work. I mean, perfect example, um, a little over a year ago, I spent six weeks down in the U.S. Virgin Islands doing hurricane recovery cleanup work after hurricanes Irma and Maria. And it was probably the best month plus of my life. And so oh. member for a day just combined all those things. So it doesn't even feel like work. I'm having the best time of my life. Uh, it's amazing. 
so impressive. And, and so I'll be the parent in the room and go, hey, you make a living from this? You know, I, and by the way, every time I tell somebody I do a podcast, they go, and you make money doing this? It's like, no, I don't make any money doing this. I just do this because I love doing yeah. this. Um, it pays for my golf. Yeah, that's all I really care yeah. about. But for you, you're going all in on this and you're going to grow it. You, it, it. Hopefully there's some skin in the game for you. Yeah, well. I mean, listen, I, I, I'm not getting into this to, to get rich. Let's be, let's be very clear about that. Um, but with that said, you know, I... To run this sort of a platform, there is marketing overhead and there's definitely technology overhead. And so I just get the nonprofits to pay me a small bit, basically just to cover that. Um, and hopefully, like you said, hopefully there's a little bit extra for me. But, you know, I think, uh, again, coming from the Internet space, I've always been growth over profits. And so what I mean by that is the only thing I care about right now is two things. One, raising as much money as possible for amazing charities and in the process, growing the community of donors and active bidders. That's it, because I know that eventually everything else will take care of itself. We build a powerful enough platform. And so I'm just in full, full, full growth mode. And you know what? If I have to eat ramen noodles for a couple weeks or a couple months, I'm okay with that. <laughs> But uh, and I'm curious. So you, d the the charity that you're working partnering with to get courses, um, they pay you a fee to bring your service to their. Audience? Basically, I get a small percentage of the total money raise. Is oh, the percentage? Yeah, so I don't charge any upfront fees. I'm doing of the total money your charity your contribution. Rate. Basically, yeah. The so. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a partnership together. Um, I'll obviously run an online auction for them and I just take a small percentage. Um, of, so it's performance based. So if we raise zero, I get zero. Um, and yes. it's especially important to me, Fred. I want to make sure to highlight this as well, because as we're starting to see more success, not surprisingly, larger and larger nonprofits are starting to reach out to me. And I, I, I did that model, um, very specifically because I didn't want to charge just some upfront fee because that would price out the smaller nonprofits. I'm in conversation with a, a really small nonprofit right now that the easiest way to describe it is almost like make a wish for golf. Um, and they don't raise a ton of money. And so I just love their mission. I love their energy. And, you know, the way my model works is, is it's just an absolute no brainer for them. Right. And so I'm trying so hard to just remember to to consistently work with smaller grassroots nonprofits with great missions because it's not just about the total amount of money raised it's about what they're going to do with the money and so if i'm just working with large organizations um and the money's not really being used for the end goal um it's not really what i got into this for and so it's really important for me to to always remember to, to work with the small grassroots nonprofits as well so you want listeners to reach out to you because a they have a nonprofit that they're trying to figure out how they're going to do some fundraising during COVID because life is so difficult right now, uh, but online auction really opens up um, for everybody to get involved. Uh, and if if they're not planning doing any charity events or they have ideas for charity events, which we really encourage everybody. If you're involved in any sort of charity at all that needs to do fundraising. And if you have any experience at all in doing fundraising, you know that golf courses generate interest. Um, and you've seen the husband and wife going, he's saying, I want to do this. I need, I, I, this is a great one. And she's going, really? Can't we just go away to wine country for the weekend? It's like, no, 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 we can do both. We can do both. We're, it's a charity. We can do this. <laughs> but but um, so you want people to get in touch with you because they they have an event coming up, but you also want people to get in touch with you because you've got these events coming up that you want people to build. Yeah, it's a, two, it's a classic two-sided marketplace. So that's right. From a consumer perspective, if you're interested in playing great golf courses while supporting charity, it's a no-brainer. Um, either All over the country. All, all over the world. I mean, we're, all we've already done a couple in the UK. So yeah, and I... Oh, wow. I spoke to a couple of people in Australia earlier this week. So yeah, it'll, it'll be global for sure. Um, so that's, that's the easy one. If you want to play great golf courses for sure, sign up on our website or just follow me on Instagram at member for a day. 
The other one, um, you know, it, 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 there's a little bit more to unpack. So yes, if you're a nonprofit that is looking to fundraise, 100% reach out to me. But what's so interesting about what you, what you said is you talked about charity golf outings. And a lot of what's happening right now because of COVID is char- charity golf outings were canceled and might even still be. I mean, we're seeing spikes now again. So a lot of charity golf outings this year were canceled. And so yep. a lot of nonprofits reached out to me and basically said, well, we're not going to have a charity golf outing. So maybe what you're doing can basically just substitute for that. But what's even more interesting to them is when you think about the time and energy it takes to put on even a small charity golf tournament, you're talking about three months of planning, caterers, tea times, you know, figuring out what software to use, scoring, prizes, sponsors. It's a lot. Mine is so simple. I mean, I can't even explain it to you. I, I if, as long as you're a great charity uh, and you do great work and you're and we're able to get good golf courses donated from your donor base and network, uh, I handle everything else. And so charities are, are, I think, really interested in my model just because of how light of a lift it is. And like I said before, I don't charge any upfront fees. Um, so it's just the, the goal is it, for it to be a win-win situation. I've talked to so many people who've come up with ideas and have started ideas and are entrepreneurial and are trying to get things you're probably one of the only people that I've ever spoken to that has a new idea that can sleep well at night. (laughs) Right. Everybody else got their idea. They're like, I'm up all night and I can't think, you know, it's like, it's just, you know, cause you hear the foot tapping in the background, you hear the fingers rolling across the tabletop and here it is, you know, it's like, Oh, am I, is this going to work? What am I going to do? That's you must be sleeping great because you're giving back. I am, but I think it's more than that. And I, I, we talked about this before earlier on the interview is that this all just happened organically, Fred, right? So I didn't wake up one day and say, I am starting a business. And I think that's very important, right? Because everything that's happening is just organic and natural. And I just feel like I, there was, I feel like the analogy is I was out surfing and all of a sudden a nice big wave came. And I just hopped on and I'm just still going for the ride. And so there's no pressure because I never even went into this with the goal of, of, of doing any of this. It was literally just to raise money and hand a check over and then go get a job and continue on my life. So there, yes, it's the charity and everything and I'm loving the work, but I can't stress that enough that everything's just happened so naturally and continues today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the idea. Thank you for for coming up with it and for pulling it off. What do you want from us? What can we do for you? This is this is now. What's the question? Is usually what's in it for me? What's in it for you? What can we do for you to help? Yeah, like we were saying before, if you if you want, if on the consumer side, if you're interested in playing great golf courses all the while supporting charity, go to memberforday.com, sign up for our email list, or just follow me on Instagram, and then. The other side is if you are a nonprofit and you're looking for new and innovative ways to fundraise, in this case, through the game of golf, shoot me an email. It's eric at memberforaday.com and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Eric is with a C, not a K. Eric is with a C. And this is so untech like of you. For someone who came from the tech world, it's member for a day is F O R A A. D A Y, not the number four. Not, the number four. So we're still working on that branding stuff. Yeah, all natural. All right. But member is spelled with all the vowels. <laughs> it's not M M B R. So it's M E M B E R F O R A D A Y dot com, not dot org. That's right. That's right. Okay. But your Instagram is member number four a day. Okay. We got that right. All right. <laughs> Well, <laughs> Eric Sandrance, this is great. And I, I wish you all the luck. I think this is really wonderful. And I admire the fact that you get to sleep. <laughs> Thanks, Fred, because I, I like to sleep. And so I don't do well in, in high pressure environments. So I, I'm very happy that I get to sleep as well. Well, it's time to thank ShotScope for their generosity in allowing us to give away 
a ShotScope V3 wearable GPS and performance tracker. It's really, I'm, we're really grateful, especially since they're currently experiencing challenges in their supply chain during COVID. But if you're interested in picking up one for yourself, you got to check their website at shotscope.com, one word shotscope. S-H-O-T-S-C-O-P-E, shotscope.com to check the availability because it's what's interesting is is it's the watch bands that they're having trouble keeping in stock. Um, and that's what's holding back keeping the orders fulfilled. Uh, longtime listeners of Golf Smarter will remember how we helped Game Golf, one of the earliest performance trackers, to get off the ground with their online fundraising campaign back in 2013. But the ShotScope V3 is so much more. First of all, you, the game golf you wore on your, on your hip, off your belt, and you had to tap it each time. But it's so much easier wearing a watch, and you don't really have to pay attention if it's, um, if it's logging in because it automatically does. Once you get each club logged into your, your, uh, your account – it knows which club you're hitting. It's so easy. And then once you get into the rhythm of it, it's really simple to use. Then after your round, when you're reviewing all the data, it is so helpful in determining how far you hit each club. You really need to know that, right? And then you go, oh yeah, it's a GPS. So that helps determine which is the best club for your next shot. But don't buy just yet. Because it's time to announce the winner, and it could be you. Congratulations to Chris Biggs of Norborough, just outside of Leicester in the heart of England. Congratulations, Chris, and thanks for listening, and of course for participating in the, the drawing. I'll be sending you and Gavin Deer, our guest for episode 763, if you want to hear more about ShotScope, and I'll email you both so that you two can confirm, confirm the shipment of your prize. And with that announcement, it's time to announce our next prize, which has been so popular we had to do it again. Next up, win a pair of Squares golf shoes, S-Q-A-I-R-Z. Now, we, first, uh, we were first introduced to Squares on episode 736 back in April of 2020 with the founder of Squares, Bob Winskowitz. Since then, they made a huge announcement that Sir Nick Faldo has partnered with the company after saying that these are the best golf shoes he's ever worn. That's the kind of testimonial that'll move you, right? Check them out at squares.com, S-Q-A-I-R-Z.com. Deadline to enter to win one, win a pair for yourself is Sunday, November 15th, 2020, midnight Pacific time, 3 a.m. Eastern. Just click on the Enter Now banner at the top of the homepage at golfsmarter.com to register to win, and good luck. Now, our guest today was a suggestion from someone I play with, and you send me suggestions, and I follow up on them. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for products or guests, I'd love to hear from you. Just click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com.